want to welcome you all to this event to honor uh, Panos Papalembos, who will receive the distinguished uh, university professorship today. But it is a particular pleasure for me to have the honor to introduce uh, Dr. Panos Papalambros, who we honor today as the newest distinguished university professor, the highest honor of a faculty appointment at the University of Michigan. Today, I feel that the achievements of our new James Burrell Angel Distinguished Professor of Engineering have demonstrated without doubt that perhaps this re revolution achieved its most fundamental purpose, and that is to make Michigan a place where exceptional faculty talent could fulfill its destiny to change the world. The floor is yours, Dr. Popper. Thank you, uh, President Dursa. Uh, I should tell the other side of the story that I'm giving the second. Uh, that the reason I'm here today is really because of Jim, Jim Duterstadt, who as Dean of Engineering, uh, after my first year here, basically came in and really changed the way we did business and defined uh, pretty much the, uh, how engineering was going to function uh, at Michigan for the next 30 years. And uh, I won't mention also as an incentive that I tripled my salary within three years. And that's not because I was so good, but because my salary was so low when I started. <laughs> so anyway, and I also want to thank Jack, um, uh, particularly since uh, it's another reason for why I'm here today, and that is because uh, uh, Jack joined uh, the department as a young faculty member when I was department chair, but he made sure that this place remain a strong and great place to work, which also is a reason why I'm here today, for having colleagues like you. Finally, I want to thank uh, Chairman Conwell Wang from Mechanical Engineering uh, for your support and for uh, taking care of this nomination, for which I'm very grateful. And finally, thank you all for coming here today. So finally, I can tell you why um, I'm here to talk about design. So first of all, uh, some of you said that uh, you had to go and check uh, your dictionary to find out what this word is, Weltanschauung. It's a German word, and so uh, knowing my Greek descent, one would think, why would this guy pick a German word? Um, aren't they nice Greek words for that? And it turns out that, you know, I thought about it. Uh, the equivalent Greek word uh, would be something like a Greek scholar, Cosmotheoria, which in English would sound like a cosmic theory. <laughs> that really was over the top. So I figured I'll stay with a German word, which actually has uh, its origins in a, a German philosophy, which is second only to Greek. And, um, <laughs> and it really talks about, it, it tries to capture the idea that um, not so much a view of the world, but the way you see the world perhaps every day. It's part of your, your makeup. And that's the sense in which I, I want to use uh, the world today. Finally, I want to mention one other thing. Uh, 14 years ago, uh, when I was uh, in a similar position receiving the Donald C. Graham Professorship in Engineering, I gave a talk entitled Designing in the Design World. At that time, I had finished uh, quite a bit of administrative work in engineering. I've been uh, suffering from uh, a bit of uh, um, uh, ambivalence towards uh, my uh, profession because what I was doing for research uh, was very sort of analytical, very uh, mathematical, but what I was doing for teaching was just the opposite. And I always have been uh, thinking uh, all those years, why can't we uh, bring sort of the, the holistic thinking of how we do things with the analytical thinking of how we think about things? So at that time, design the design world um, uh, lecture, I sort of proposed that this can be done. And so this kind of is what we've been doing, myself and many of my colleagues that I work with uh, uh, in the past 15 years or so. So let's proceed. Happily, Jim did a nice uh, job introducing um, James Burrell Angel and explaining why I picked this name. In fact, it was in discussions with him that I decided 
that this name, surprise, surprise, nobody had picked it up before me, was available. And this fellow, this is Prexy Angel, um, was actually a real polymath. He, he really ranged his interest from uh, being, uh, as, uh, as we said, a civil engineer, to being a modern languages, to being an international law, even uh, visiting um, and staying in China as an ambassador for a while. So I really liked the fact that um, he represented this sort of broad uh, interest um, that I sort of aspire to. So, designs are things. So we want to talk about designs. Designs are things. But designing is about people. So a lot of what I will tell you now is uh, about people. So let's think a little bit about that. Design science. Design science. Here, give you some examples. This is uh, 18th century BC, the Code of Hammurabi talks about what happens if you build, if you design and build something, and it fails. If it kills somebody, they kill you. If it kills somebody's son, they kill that somebody's son. It was very serious business, designing and building things. If you like engineering, it was very serious business. Uh, jumping uh, to uh, Vitruvius, 25 BC, this is an interesting story. In theaters, there are the bronze vessels placed in niches under the seats in accordance with mathematical principles. These vessels are arranged with a view to musical concords or harmony in such a way that when the voice of an actor falls in unison with any of them, its power is increased and it reaches the ears of the audience with greater clearness and sweetness. Now, of course, um, uh, the Greeks who studied this uh, building said that the Romans did it simply because they didn't know how to build amphitheaters without <laughs> additions. But besides the point, it's clear that they were thinking in, term for, in terms of mathematical uh, principles that will dictate how they design things to be used. And Vitruvius later on says another thing in the same book, um, of arch about architecture. Let the stone be taken from the quarry two years before building is to begin, not in winter, but in summer. Then let it lie exposed in an open place, such stone as being damaged by the two years of exposure should be used in the foundations. The rest, which remains unhurt, has passed the test of nature and will endure in those parts of the building which are above ground. Now this gives information about how you design with things, and it relates design with what we call these days evidence-based knowledge, as opposed to, say, mathematical knowledge. And on, by Renaissance now, Alberti, a rather famous architect at the time, in another book called On the Art of Building, talks about what is an architect. Is there another carpenter? He might consider the architect who, by sure and wonderful reason and method, knows both how to devise through his own mind and energy and to realize by construction whatever can be most beautifully fitted out for the noble needs of man by the movement of weights and the joining and massing of bodies. So what we see here is another step in linking design with reasoning about knowledge, which is really the essence of what we do in science. And I pick up these uh, this, uh, examples from architecture because architecture actually is, what, is the earliest discipline that has struggled with the need to use physics and science to analyze how we make buildings with also the need to make the buildings beautiful and useful to the people that live in them. So they have addressed uh, this sort of uh, 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 dual view about design uh, early on. And finally, there is a quote from a, an article in Euroscience uh, Research from 2004 that talks about the aha moment. This is the creativity part of design. It's a very uh, major sort of part of design thinking to talk about creativity. And what they say is the aha moment. Talks about a 
fMRI. Corresponds to a sudden burst of high frequency brain activity in the right interior superior temporal gyrus. I'm not sure what that is. Um, but the brain response was immediately preceded by bursts of slower alpha wave activity measured over the posterior cortex, likely reflecting a transient blocking of incoming visual information. Unless you're a neuroscientist, this sounds like mumbo jumbo. But what in fact is happening is that, which is particularly appealing to uh, engineers, is that we now seem to have objective quote, objective metrics of what's happening in our brain. And it's not just uh, behavioral science that we sort of infer um, what will happen. Um, some students in the design science program um, uh, a, a year ago created a very nice animation, and uh, this is uh, uh, where that is, that shows how um, sort of events in design science uh, started accumulating over time, and, and it's a timeline of uh, different papers, different words uh, um, that you find in the literature. So a lot of this uh, data analytics these days can actually help us trace the evolution of ideas in unique ways. So that was about design science. So let's talk a little bit about Welt and Schaun. And the best way to do it is by looking at some questions. And so I'll ask you a few questions. I'll show you something. I'd like you to pay close attention, please. So here it goes. The first step of the ollie is to get your feet into the right position. Put your front foot across the middle of your board. Put the ball of your back foot in the center of your tail. The next thing you want to do is bend your knees. The more you bend, the higher you can go. As you straighten your legs and start your jump, a few things must happen. Fully extend your back leg, pushing your tail to the ground. Roll your front foot until the side of your shoe is touching the grip tape. Lift your front leg up, dragging your shoe up the board toward the nose. Push your front foot forward and pull your back leg up toward your chest. Now that you've leveled out, let your legs straighten out a little bit as gravity brings you back down. When you feel your wheels hit the ground, let your knees bend again to soften the landing. This last step really comes in handy when you're landing off a big gap or a large set of stairs. So is this skateboard a good design? It's not rhetorical. It's so is it a good design? Who says yes? I may take exception, but have you ever skateboarded? So how do you know it's a good design? OK, I'm not pick. It looks good, right? Well, you could get an airboard. Ah, OK. Now, I have to tell you, um, th I've been using this <coughs> um, in many talks for the last, I don't know how many years, because I cannot find a better uh, example. And I can tell you a quick story how I came into this. Um, my son had a senior science project um, in, um, in our high school. And I, I, of course, I had to try to help. And uh, I tried to figure out something that would be um, interesting to him. And he, he is a, or was a skateboarder. And so uh, I said, well, let's pick a skateboard and maybe do a free body diagram analysis, you know, put some physics there. And uh, I ran into this uh, video and I started looking at it and looking at this ma magnetic foot that picks it up. And I said, Holy God, I don't know how to model this thing. This is really tough. Uh, Maybe my colleague, Art Quo, knows how to model this, but this is really difficult. And so, okay, if I model the physics, going back to design, how does it good, what does good mean? I can model it using the physics, and I can see how I can analyze it, but how do I know it's good? How do I know it's good even if I never skated myself? But then you say, okay, if the requirement for judging something good requires personal experience, which is uh, frequently what uh, is being advocated, um, how can we deal with the little bit more complicated things? For example, one of the tenets in, in uh, propagated in product design community is that we should fail and fail early in design. That's a big motto in that community. 
Well, think about um, the fact uh, how a NASA engineer would feel about this. <laughs> so what may fit in one domain doesn't necessarily translate in another. So the question to is this a escape or a good design, to me remains an open question. Uh, but anyway, let's look at some other ones. Are these objects beautiful? Is this beautiful? By the way, you know what this is? Now you know, Lynn, why, my wife, why we went to see this. Um, is this beautiful? Ah. OK, you see where I'm going with this. This is divine beauty. This is, of course, the Parthenon, which we all knew it's beautiful. But now, did you know that the second generation Volkswagen bug was actually following the golden section um, proportions. And so did the first iPod. And of course, this is the rotonda. Well, how I got into this uh, specifically in, in terms of research, because I had a student from architecture, Hyunjun Park, and he decided he was going to create beauty by picking the um, the uh, proportionality rules that the, uh, the Greeks, as it were, Papus and Nicomachus had uh, created, of, of which the golden section was one, and coded it in um, using something called genetic algorithms, where you basically define a design and using this evolutionary uh, sort of idea, uh, looking for uh, how to increase fitness, you generate from the parents using mutations and crossovers, you generate a new population, and so this is a way of mimicking how nature creates optimized, better designs. So what he did is he used this idea to analyze villas, in particular, Palladio's villas. Andrea Palladio, famous architect in the Renaissance, built a lot of villas for rich people in northern Italy, and one of them was the Villa Rotonda. So what uh, Park did was to uh, use uh, GA, genetic algorithms, to uh, change the design by uh, manipulating and quote optimizing with respect to uh, different proportionality rules. So these are four different designs that he generated with different forms of proportionality. And the question is, well, which one do you prefer? Which one is more beautiful? Well, he named the villas after his committee members. So this is the Villa Papalambros. So I kind of <laughs> like that one. And then he fooled around with other things like Mondrian's. And so here are some other compositions created again by optimizing the proportionality, uh, 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 the presence of proportionality in, um, in the painting in different ways. Now, let me ask you another question. Here are some bottle shapes. So which bottle do you prefer? Which you think is more beautiful or attractive or useful? Now don't try to guess. But you see, you're all doing this. So which you prefer now? So the question is, uh, how do we deal with shapes of things in a old, more engaging way than the GAs. The genetic algorithm sort of defines up front uh, a criterion. In this case, we knew the criterion was the um, golden section and like that. But suppose now you don't know what the criterion is because it's something that people know, but you don't. So what you do is you can use an interactive process which brings the human in and instead of um, using a, a priori defined uh, preference function, if you like, you ask people. Okay, and this we call interactive genetic algorithms, or IGA. So you can design, for example, a color bottle to try to find which shape would be best. And so you do um, a, a parametric sort of representation of the bottle, so you can manipulate it in real time. And so you, uh, one example of this study is done a few years ago. Uh, you can show a user um, a number of um, shapes, and the user picks one or two, depending on the um, instructions you give, and doesn't necessarily rank them in a hedonic, meaning the most uh, preferred way, but just says, I like this one and this one. 
And then based on this input, you generate a new set of designs guided by the previous choices. And so uh, when you do this, uh, essentially what you do is perhaps, uh, this is with single user, you might end up sort of converging to a particular shape. And in this case, we actually did it. Surprise, surprise, was, you know, a Coca-Cola bottle. Now, of course, this wasn't particularly scientific because my colleagues from uh, psychology will very quickly say, well, it's all biased because we've all seen it. it we're it's kind of fooling around, frankly, and I don't know that you can find people who have never seen a Coca-Cola bottle anywhere in the world. Um, remember the, uh, the, the film, anyway. Um, what, what was kind of fun, though, is that about that time, uh, we're also uh, uh, running a course called, uh, uh, we started a few years ago, called Analytical Product Design. And some of you um, in this audience have taken that class. So one of the teams uh, decided that, gee, that sounds like a good idea. We were just uh, telling them about this um, methodology. So they were designing a rain barrel, and they wanted to make it attractive and so forth. So um, one of part of the project was to find what's the most attractive shape. So they actually used this method and uh, tried it with different people and came up with this design. They kind of kludged it together as this doesn't quite look that way, but this is from the Design Expo. Now, what's interesting is uh, about a year later, this product appeared, uh, and we found it on Amazon, and to this day, we don't know how this came to be. I queried closely the students long after they graduated whether they had sort of picked up the idea, and they swore that no, they hadn't. <laughs> now, the project was actually uh, public, so um, who knows? But anyway, so there it is. Next question. Three car shapes here. Which car is the greenest? I can say, wait a minute, these are all red. How can it be green? Okay, so you know, green as in eco-friendly. Now you can probably say the, the second one is, looks like a Prius, but what about the other ones? Well, so another student, Tahira Reed, looked at the shape of greenness in her thesis. She was actually the first uh, student that got her PhD in the design science program. And the idea was to look at different silhouettes and try to collect and interpret the preference of people about what shape would make things look green. Now, why would she look at that? Well, part of the reason was at the time, um, the first uh, electric and hybrid electric vehicles were coming to the market. It was a big debate in, uh, in the industry. Do we make these vehicles look really different so they stand out? Or do we just put a badge in the back and not draw attention to the fact that they're hybrids, but say simply they're just like other vehicles, just a lot more eco-friendly. Um, I think it's clear uh, that uh, some companies followed one path, some others another. Uh, Toyota actually followed both paths. And um, it was interesting that the Prius sold uh, heavily in the Hollywood uh, sort of community for uh, because People there wanted to look green, no matter if the car was only $20,000. Anyway, uh, Tahir actually studied this extensively and found some interesting things, like, for example, there is a measurable shape of perceived environmental friendliness, and this graph shows uh, perceived environmental friendliness versus just preference. I like this more. Uh, this is the Prius. We put this as a ringer. This is sort of the highest uh, rated one. It turns out there's some follow-up studies that showed certain elements and points on the shape of the silhouette uh, affected uh, this type of preference. Now, uh, yet another student, Eric McDonald, asked the question, if you profess to be green, why are you not buying green? I think we all have a little bit of that syndrome. And uh, in her study, basically what she found is that there are some complex design attributes like sustainability that we really don't have good metrics to say whether this is in fact sustainable. Uh, it's not obvious. Uh, and so what we do is we use surrogates. Uh, for example, in paper towels, which she studied, and uh, uh, we look at a percent of recycled content. 
but it turns out that this percent is, a, is used as a surrogate, but it may not be true. And so uh, oftentimes designers, marketers, and users have different ideas about the surrogates and things um, in the market become sort of wrong. Yet another student, Sumon Azeri, looked at the question, can you change human behavior by design? So she did a study about napkins. And she said, okay, if I, instead of using this dispenser, I use this one, which shows a tree, and as I pull papers out, I diminish the tree, I'm cutting down the tree. Maybe that'll make people think twice. And by the way, we can also put another tree, like the Christmas tree, it was getting close to the holidays, to see if it's the tree and not the metaphor of conservation that plays out. She actually spent quite a bit of time, many weeks at uh, Sweetwaters uh, and a couple of other places. And it was interesting. It was about a 45% uh, drop in consumption of, of paper napkins in the shop once she used the metaphor. Went up again and then down and a little bit up uh, uh, right about Christmas time. In fact, um, the uh, owner of the shop really wanted her to continue the experiments for uh, many more months. They save thousands of napkins. Finally, uh, while we're talking about minds and brains, we also have to remember that people have bodies. And so there's a lot of things about the ergonomics and the uh, anthropometry, the, the measurements that we have that are important as we make decisions about design. Um, this, is a web, this is actually an app that Matt Parkinson at Penn State developed, which I, Matt, um, yeah, you gotta put this back on the app store. But uh, Matt is actually preparing a very interesting um, collection of guidelines for designers that will be available online uh, this summer. Okay, back to skateboard. Who designed the first skateboard? Quick, 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 quick. These guys did. So the skateboard was actually designed not by a single individual, but by <clears throat> a group of people, the surfers in Southern California who wanted to practice while they couldn't go on the waves. So this is an example of what I would call today a design crowdsourcing. We're getting um, uh, from an individual designer to uh, designing things using crowds. So um, an example here is the question of whether uh, the sort of collective intelligence of a crowd can be used to teach a machine, a computer, to design. So um, Max here and has been working on this um, with some of our colleagues in um, psychology and computer science to look at questions like this. If I show you uh, two shapes of objects, let's say it's a car, which of the two uh, styles you prefer? So you, you click and you uh, choose, and then it, in real time, just like with the IGAs, uh, you create uh, new options. The difference here is that these designs are more sophisticated in, in terms of having a lot more variables. So the, the methods developed in computer science around um, uh, machine learning are becoming very uh, important here. Now the idea actually machine learning, like all these methods, is very simple. If I ask you questions and you tell me that I like A better than B, better than C, whatever that question is, let's say safety, that A is safer than B, safer than C. Essentially, in the design space, I set them up in these three spots, and then I can draw a line or a curve through them, like we call in engineering curve fitting. Well, if I know what this line is, then I can go and find the best one and say, okay, this is the safest design, and I can find what the new design is. Of course, uh, doing this with a large number of people and a large number of dimensions is, is not so easy, but that's basically the idea. So uh, some experiments that uh, we did uh, using um, uh, the survey mechanism in Amazon called Mechanical Turk would look at interesting things. So uh, we did a little survey with uh, 66 people, and it turns out that 30 people like this and 36 people like that as final preferred design with respect to safety. And uh, you wonder now, is this an accident because these are almost the same, or is this something really different in these? 
Uh, another thing that you find, I'm talking mostly about how difficult it is to deal with people. Um, another thing you find is you ask a question to pick, let's say, between these two, and then after, I don't know, 15 or so questions, you ask the same thing again. And what you find is about half of your people give you an opposite answer than they did, you know, just a minute ago. So you have to say, okay, uh, is this the preference of people noisy, it moves around, or just people change as they, uh, as they follow these interactions? So one of the things you do, which is also used in, um, in um, uh, the com uh, uh, computer science community, is to look at uh, getting features out of this data. And the features can be uh, uh, things like um, data, but it also may have physical interpretation. So in this case of the uh, object, if you were uh, thinking that maybe I have more uh, crash space here or the heaviness or um, the handling as being features of the design, then you can start making more sense about why people make these choices. So finally, another thing about this is that when you go from preference to evaluation, things get more interesting because when you do a crowdsourcing and you ask the question uh, from the crowd, which one is the best? And there is an objective answer. How do you get that? And the way you get it is when you uh, look at the individual scores and you aggregate them, you want to be able to believe that the experts in the crowd are the people I need to listen to most. Well, uh, how would you know that? Well, the assumption is that an expert would be somebody who has uh, strong knowledge about it, therefore be consistent on, uh, on, the, uh, on their evaluations, and the experts will congregate their answers around the correct answer. I mean, this is the assumption. Well, um, we did some studies with uh, both Amazon and Turk, and also in class, looking at how structural designs, simple brackets, that you subject them in uh, loads, which one will be strongest. And we collected the data, and here's some interesting result. We found that uh, there are experts in the crowd that will aggregate their answers, as you expect. But there are also other people who aggregate their answers to other places, and these people just happen to be wrong, but have strong opinions about it. Okay, now it's no surprise, but this confounds these methods of trying to extract expertise out of the crowd. Anyway, this is ongoing activity, and it will be interesting to see where it goes. So I've been talking about art and computer science and architecture, so what about real engineering design? All right, so I'm going to uh, show you a couple of examples real quick to see how design science links with, quote, real engineering. So I mentioned about hybrid electric vehicles. This is a, an important area, and it's interesting for us because um, apart from all the other greenness of it uh, or potential greenness, it's new technology. We cannot rely on experience very much as we used it for con conventional powertrains. So a, a hybrid vehicle like this with a parallel architecture where you have the, um, the diesel engine sort of, and then you have the electric drive, um, what we do in engineering is we create the simulations, okay? So we can simulate it using different environments, and eventually we create this mathematical optimization problem, which is what we all do, um, in engineering, where you want to maximize something like the fuel economy, uh, I mean, the minimize the economy, or uh, so, um, sorry, maximize the fuel economy, minimize the consumption. And then you put a lot of constraints to make sure this vehicle will work as intended. So this is a typical problem that we translate to a mathematical statement, and then we use the simulations to look as the alternatives actually perform as extended. As a lot of people worked on this area, uh, particularly in the design and control, my colleague Guy Polso has been a big collaborator in this area. Now, what's interesting though is, okay, it's fine to minimize fuel economy, that's a typical engineering problem, but there's more to it that links to design science. 
an example. I'll give you a couple of examples. So one question is, fine, I developed this uh, uh, vehicle that has uh, a good fuel economy, but would anybody buy it or would anybody make money out of it? So what you really want to do instead of looking for fuel economy uh, optimization is to maximize, if you are uh, believing in the, in the capitalistic market, you maximize profit. Right? So then it means that you have to generate a different optimization model where the decisions are not just the design anymore, but also the price and the production volume that determine cost, demand in the market, and profit, and then optimize profit. So this requires now linking engineering with marketing, possibly economics, and if you push it a little further, with public policy, because regulations actually affect a lot how uh, cost structures, for example, uh, create, uh, are created for the manufacturers. And so this is an example uh, of work that was early uh, pioneered with uh, Jeremy Halleck, working with uh, Fred Feinberg in the business school, where in fact you create a competitive marketplace with many producers like this, playing a, basically a game to, to reach what uh, we call Nash equilibrium. Who remembers Nash equilibrium? Uh, anybody knows? This is uh, Russell Crowe, you know, uh, the beautiful mind. That's the guy. That was Nash. And basically the idea that um, the market will coalesce to a, a situation where nobody has anything more to gain. So this is how you can use this concept of uh, engineering and embed it now into examining what is the impact of regulations on what will actually happen in the marketplace. Similar problem that looking uh, recently is uh, the question of what people call range anxiety with electric vehicles. Right? How many vehicles, uh, how much uh, do you feel secure if you're able to uh, use only electric power? The problem is that uh, if you had uh, the ability to um, um, recharge any time you want, then this anxiety would not be there. However, the manufacturers of the vehicles are not those who also control the location of the charging stations. So it turns out in a study that we did for Southeast Michigan with Nam Gu Kang is that if the EV, manuf the electric vehicle manufacturer and the charging station operator make their decisions separately they'll basically decide that this is not a particularly good investment because the range is too small and the, the, um, the charging station operators think there's, uh, therefore the market will be small so they don't invest in making more charging stations. So instead, what you have to do, and in fact that's why you don't have charging stations, most of them are just public, okay? when we don't worry about profit, right? So what happens though, if you create a different scenario and say, okay, if I design the charging station system as well as the vehicles and decide what the range should be, can I find a solution? It turns out, yes, that if those two collaborate, uh, they can actually both make money with uh, not particularly um, uh, significant more cost uh, to the individuals, but if they work separately, they don't. So that kind of scenario is something else you can run. Now, um, you don't want to talk about military things, but, but we do, uh, because a lot of uh, concern has been uh, in the last 10, 15 years about people getting killed uh, in the battlefield. And in fact, one of the problems was that these vehicles here were not considered very safe so the, uh, the government and the army generated these much heavier vehicles. So you say, which of these two vehicles is safer? And I say here, it's not what you might think. And so one simple study that uh, another student, Stephen Hoffinson, did, um, it was a side study. He basically looked at uh, injury data and found out that the cost of the, the, the number of injuries that you have is not just in the people who are in the vehicles, but also in the people who are in the convoys that bring the fuel to the vehicles. 
So if you build a very heavy vehicle, the people who are in it uh, will be better protected, but it will require more fuel to get to them. Therefore, more pu people are going to be injured getting the fuel to them. And there's a trade-off. And it turns out the trade-off is you know, somewhere between these two. But you can see the social problem or the military problem. How do you actually make this compromise decision and say, OK, some of you are going to get killed more because we're going to save the others. So it's really hard. But the point, again, is that you can analyze these things if you take a systems thinking approach. So that's the last point I want to bring, systems thinking. Saya Gassi, uh, he came to launch Tesla Motors back in 2008, and he said this. I learned how to understand in his former job, excuse me, job at SAP uh, consulting firm, is I learned how to understand a big problem, break it into small pieces, solve every one of these pieces, and reintegrate them back into a system. And the reason manufacturers have failed with electric cars is because they didn't have systemic thinking. Now, it's interesting that these words, break into small systems and solve this and reintegrate, are what we call partition and coordination uh, in optimization jargon called decomposition strategy. And there's many ways to do this. So, for example, a company may do a partition this way or may do it this way. And this one is a partition based on the pieces. This one is a partition based on the disciplines involved. And then the question is, how do manufacturers do this? Which one? Actually, they do both. Yeah, the organizations are basically matrix organizations because there's two decompositions. Now, it gets more interesting uh, when you talk about coordination. And the coordination is the way you sort of solve the, the problem once you've broken it up. Now, uh, this sort of a hierarchical coordination where some boss decides, tells the underlings, and hopefully if, if, if the boss wants to hear to the underlings, they can get some feedback and rethink. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it's not. But mathematically, it can happen always, right? Uh, there's a lot more complicated process that I, I wanted to show you some math, but not more than this. And I don't expect you to read it. But the concept is simple. The problem we have always in a large system design problem is you set up the top goals, what we call the mission goals, but the system is made up from all these pieces and it might involve uh, hundreds and thousands uh, or a thousand people. How do you propagate the goals of the top of the organization to all the pieces? So this is what industry uh, calls target cascading or flow down requirements. And what we did was to translate this into a mathematical formulation, actually show how it works, not only in engineering, but in other uh, systems. Now, I'll tell you why I'm telling you this. Because last fall, um, I was teaching um, with Mike Umbriak the uh, ME250 uh, design class. This is a sophomore design class. And Carly, you were a student there, right? So you can tell me if I'm making stories. But one of the things we did was to, de to design a game for them, which was their term project. And this was the end ball game. So they had an arena. This was uh, roughly the size of two ping pong tables. There was a tower that, that had balls like these. And uh, there were two uh, baskets uh, set that they can score. Um, and there were some holes here where they can also score by putting the balls. So they had to pick the balls and score, OK? Now, we gave them some instruction. The way we organized the class was 160 students. So we broke them up in eight teams, 20 students. And each 20 student um, uh, section was a, we called a squad, OK? And the squad had four teams of five students each. So each team cor corresponded to a player, and the player was a robotic device remotely controlled. So each squad, each group of 20, would have to design four robots okay, to win the game playing against the other team. And we gave them the instruction and said, look, you have to think first as a squad. So the 20 of you have to get together and decide how you're going to win. Okay, 
look at what you have to accomplish and then decompose this function that means to win, right? Uh, which is to score and decompose it into functions for each of the players. Okay, that way you develop the, the, the winning strategy, okay? Now recognize that this is basically target cascading, right? Because we're telling them how to take the specifications at the top and define what each of the individual robots will do and recognize that these robots had to cooperate, work as a team. All right, well, here's what happened. Okay, here they are. Actually, I stole them after the, well, I had paid anyways. Um, all right, so you can take a look afterwards. So what happened though is, okay, we had fun, but what happened is that they really had not done target cascading. None of the squads have done it. And it became very clear that although individually they did a pretty good job, the four, the four groups are supposed to work as a squad by and large, fail to do that, okay? They, a, a good example is a, a large number of these robots got stuck in some holes there, and there was no rescue. The other guys had not thought of a rescue function in the team to go and get them out of the hole so they can continue to play. Okay. I want to remind you that target cascading and things like this is a very important, uh, and it, it goes beyond uh, thinking of design as a small activity. And as I said before, how many sticky notes do you need to unleash the creative interactions of a thousand engineers and, and physicists? Sticky notes is the typical way that we are creative, right? Well, how you do this with a thousand engineers? And uh, Anna Maria McGowan is, uh, from NASA actually is, is finishing up her PhD uh, talking about this problem. Okay. Was the skateboard a good design? Look at these. So I have no clue. I don't know which is a good design. But I do know that a lot of people helped me think about these problems. And so this is the time I'd like to offer my thanks to the people that are involved. And I start with... Uh, yeah, my, my family back uh, in Greece when I was growing up, um, if they looked like they're always around a table, well, that's because the food is good. Uh, my, uh, my elementary school, uh, anyway, you get the idea. Um, this is important. And, and uh, your family influences you. So does this family um, and friends and even some not, uh, family but not quite humans. Um, but, um, you know, I want to thank my family here today for, uh, and my friends, I should say, if you don't recognize, this is Professor Olsoy and his wife, and the reason I put it there is to remind him and thank him for um, keeping me healthy in uh, brain and body for 30 years or so. I want to thank uh, my students, present and past, in the Optimal Design Lab. Um, I get away by uh, basically appropriating their work without looking like I'm doing it. 
Uh, it's a privilege of professor. I want to thank my colleagues in mechanical engineering. This picture is uh, from the mid-90s, and we took it, you know where, in the atrium of the X building. Um, you can see some mines, and this was in an annual report, but this one is what I like better. And this is an archive, it hasn't been published. This was a picture I asked them to take, and they were good sports. Um, so thank you, my colleagues. I also want to thank my current family, so to speak, in um, the university, the Integrative Systems and Design Group, that have been great to work with, and I get a lot of energy uh, from them. The design science program and all the people that, uh, faculty and students, that uh, have really made a unique uh, program uh, in the country. And a lot of my colleagues around the country and the world, this is a picture from, uh, okay, some years ago when uh, I, uh, we got together and had a, a, a uh, an event that was called Design Frontiers, but really what it was, it was my 60th uh, birthday <laughs> event, so. But that was a way to get some money for it. Um, and most of all, I wanna thank my students. Uh, these are pictures of them uh, fooling around in the classroom. Uh, uh, that's kind of the reason um, I've been here uh, and I'm still here today. So, finally, regarding a design science Weltanschauung, let me show you this is design science. Um, there's a lot of technology, you need the people, there's a lot of things going on here that couple not just technology but a lot of other uh, knowledge and of course money. So this is design science, and this is Anshaung. Um, yeah, you probably don't know who this guy is, but it's been a while. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, you guys took too much time, so I was on time. But you have to finish up. Yeah, OK. Thanks, Panos. So we have time for a few questions. Um, Just a couple. I think the reception started at 5.15, so I think uh, let's see if okay. we have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, you can take a look at these if you want afterwards, uh, but I want them back. <laughs> questions? Yes, Brian. Panos, uh, I want to ask a question about the clustering, about the clustering project. It's okay, he's got a loud professor, professorial so, voice. Yeah, I don't, I don't use mine. Um, about the clustering project. So the experts presumably have a really good model for how to support the physics of static bodies work. And I wonder if part of the problem with these other clusters is they have specific errors in their model. And is there, is there a way to try and understand what those errors might be by which wrong things they pick? This is what we're trying to do. And actually, I even tried it uh, with my students, all right, because I did it in my class. And uh, for uh, some uh, programmatic reasons, uh, I, we did the experiment, and then we went back asking them probing questions about 10 days later. And guess what? They said they couldn't remember why they picked what they did. <laughs> so we need to push that. But you're absolutely right. Jim. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Minecraft? Minecraft. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. It's a Swiss game uh, that's kind of uh, captured most of the 10-year-olds around the world in designing and building things using social groups. And it seems tailor-made to begin this kind of philosophy, hmm. this worldview that you have very early in life. And these are the kids that are now entering as first-year students in the university. And so they are used to building hmm. and designing virtual worlds. You ought to look at it, because this is not a I hadn't thought about it. game. Yeah, 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 this yeah, yeah. This is probably yeah. the most popular game right now for young people. And it is designed by the, uh, by the Swedes to actually give them the capacity okay. to design and build. Carly, your assignment. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it.
Take one more question, yeah. Yeah. How do you approach a situation when you have all the answers but haven't asked a question yet? Like in these studies where you're looking at all of the shapes and you, you've got what everyone has said, but you didn't set up the experiment. You don't know what was varied. Um, okay, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> Sounded like Jeopardy. You're looking at big data. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Now you have answers from the web. Yeah. But you never, but set you up never the asked a question. You didn't set up the experiment, but you've got the data to right. be able to answer a question right. if you know what right. it is. Right, right, right. Actually, this is a, uh, I think, in the machine learning community, which you know, I'm learning as we go uh, from my colleagues. Uh, this is an interesting question, which they actually try to address in, uh, in what appears to be almost magic, right? Because they find patterns in data, and they may or may not be uh, interpretable. But when they are interpretable, they become very interesting. And so I, I think going back to what Brian was saying, I, I think we have a lot to learn from uh, computer science because actually these guys don't think about the problems that we're thinking. So that gives us an opportunity to um, sort of advance the knowledge without interfering with their science, so to speak. Yeah. OK. Uh, let's once again congratulate Panos for the Distinguished University Professorship. Thank you.